I remember a moment of grace enabling me to fly while on an airplane, in fact, many years ago. I was headed to Texas, and we took off from Boston in a cloudy, gray early evening, and as we gained altitude, we threw th flew through a thick layer of cloud. As I think some of you know, flying is not one of my altogether favorite activities, and taking off and landing are my least favorite parts of flying, and I used to have this mistaken notion that it was through my own personal efforts that the plane I was riding in stayed up in the air. And if I stopped trying to mentally keep the plane up through the clenching of my teeth throughout the duration of the flight, then we were sure to come down. Now, to be totally honest, I actually still believe this. <laughs> I love that I put that in the past tense. I absolutely believe that it is through my efforts alone that the plane stays up in the air, but I am working on it. Anyway, so there I was, clenching, when we came up through the cloud cover and into a perfect sunset. And the top side of the clouds were completely lit up with this orange, radiant light. And it was so bright that it came through the little windows of the plane and it lit up all of our faces. And the sun was this shining globe. It was one of the most awesome sights I've ever seen in my life. And in that moment, I forgot my clenching. And I knew with a certainty that I still remember that I was being held up. Now, of course, by the time the plane was making its horrible, bumpy descent into Houston, I had lost a little bit of that feeling. But I didn't forget. And I was a little bit different because I knew something that I had not known before about who or what was really keeping the plane of my life in the air. I know that there are some people who are able to live in grace much more than others, but most of us are not able to hold on to grace. Like a cat, it is elusive. It cannot be grasped or held against its will but we can have moments of it, little tastes of grace, when we understand something, when we feel a clarity, moments when we feel like we have found exactly what we were looking for, and we know that we have what we need. And then the moment is gone, but we can be changed by these moments if we remember them and if we hold on to the glimpse of the world they show us. Because I believe that in these moments we experience the world and ourselves as whole. This is the world as it is, but also the world as it might be, lit up by radiant orange light. Perhaps these moments show us the world as it is meant to be. And to me, these moments are reminders that the daily life I live is connected to this much deeper life, a life I don't see all the time, usually because I am too distracted, too busy trying to control the details and keep the plane in the air. Anne Lamott describes grace as the force that infuses our lives and keeps letting us off the hook. She writes, it is unearned love, the love that goes before and greets us on the way. It is the help you receive when you have no bright ideas left, when you are empty and desperate and dis have discovered that your best thinking and your most charming charms have failed you. Grace is what takes you away from that isolated place and puts you with others who are as startled and embarrassed, but eventually as grateful as you are to be there. Now, this is not a particularly theological definition, perhaps, but what I know is that there is grace in those profound and deeply reassuring moments when we realize that we are not alone that we can, in fact, be helped by others. 
Sometimes it is just knowing that there are others who are willing to be with us when our ideas and our charm has completely run out is all the help that we need. As some of you know, we seem to be in a cycle of things breaking around the church. And last Saturday, our elevator broke right before a big wedding. The mother of the bride was mobility impaired, And our elevator was one of the important reasons that the couple had chosen to be married here. Needless to say, this was not a good moment. (laughs) But Mindy, our wedding sexton, was calm and dependable, and she called Jeff close, who was calm and dependable, and came running right over. And he called the police chief, who was calm and dependable. And they got the elevator alarm to stop screaming, which was a major improvement in the overall wedding conditions. (laughs) Now, we could not get the elevator to work before the wedding. So the grace that visited me and surrounded me during this episode was not the grace of God's intervention with the broken elevator sensor mechanism. The grace for me was in knowing and really experiencing that I was not trying to solve this problem alone. And I hope that there was grace for the mother of the bride. And I believe that there was grace for her since she responded with such humor and dignity and won what I would call good grace to being carried up and down the stairs. Another one of my favorite lay theologians also believes that grace is related to love. Kathleen Norris is a poet and a writer. She's a faithful Presbyterian and also an oblate or a lay follower in the Benedictine tradition. And one of her books is a sort of personal theological dictionary called Amazing Grace, a Vocabulary of Faith in which she wrestles with the weighty theological language she encounters upon her return to the church after an absence of most of her adulthood. And she has a wonderful perspective on church, perhaps best summed up for me in her approach to reading the Bible. She writes, many people these days feel an absence in their lives, expressed as an acute desire for something more, for a spiritual home, a community of faith. But when they try to read the Bible, they end up throwing it across the room. And to me, this seems encouraging. This is a good place to start, a sign of real engagement. For Kathleen Norris, grace is a way of seeing with love. She imagines grace as God's way of seeing. She writes about the character Jacob in the Hebrew Bible. Remember, he is the one who steals his brother's blessing and deceives his dying father, cheats his brother, and then runs away and prospers. And after all of that, he comes home wanting to seek reconciliation. And on that trip home, he has a dream in which he is given a blessing by God. And he wakes up from the dream saying, surely God is in this place, and I didn't know it. And for once, Jacob does the right thing right away, and he sets up a little shrine so that others who come by will know that that's a holy place. And Norris writes, Jacob's exclamation is one that remains with me, a reminder that God can choose to dwell everywhere and anywhere. One morning this past spring, I noticed a young couple with an infant at an airport departure gate. The baby was staring intently at other people, and as soon as he recognized a human face, no matter whose it was, no matter if it was young or old or pretty or ugly or bored or happy or worried looking, the baby would respond with this absolute and utter delight. It was so beautiful to see. Our drab departure gate had become the gate of heaven. And as I watched the baby play with any adult who would allow it, I felt as awestruck as Jacob because I realized this is how God looks at us. I suspect that only God and well-loved infants can see this way. But it gives me hope, she says. 
the seeing full of grace.